welcome back to the class on uh, human resource management. Uh, in this lecture, we will be touching upon a very, very important topic that is very close to my heart and that is business ethics. Uh, again, usual sources, places where I have taken this information from, there is a book by uh, Gilmore and Williams who are the editors of this book. Uh, I have referred to an article in this book by Christy and Christy, the article is called Ethics and Human Resource Management. Um, I have referred to a business ethics book called uh, Business Ethics, third edition, South Asia edition by Crane and Matten, which is a standard textbook for business ethics, easily available in the market. Uh, and of course, our favorite Gomez Mejia, Balkin and Cardi, the basic human resources book. Let us get straight to the point, business ethics and the law. Various terms come up when we talk about ethics. We, we talk about morality, we talk about ethics, we talk about the law. What is the difference between ethics and the law? The law is the definition of the minimum acceptable standards of behavior. Okay. So, uh, law is an application of ethics. Law is what is acceptable in the society that we live in that if not followed can be punishable, hmm? applicable standards of behavior. Uh, business ethics is primarily concerned with those issues not covered by the law or where there is no definite consensus on whether something is right or wrong. Business ethics begins where the law ends. When we talk about the law, everything is clear cut, this is right, this is not right, this is lawful, this is not lawful. When we talk about business ethics, business ethics is refers to, to um, uh, those behaviors that may or may not be considered unlawful and there are no clear cut definitions, but these behaviors are unethical behaviors are those behaviors which are definitely uncomfortable for a large section of the society. These are behaviors that people around us indulge in, but they can be considered as uncomfortable. They may not be unlawful, but they are definitely uncomfortable for us. Uh, you know, as we say sometimes that uh, your nose ends where mine begins, which means please do not do something that can hurt me. You know, I have a right to my own personal bubble. I have, um, uh, uh, when we talk about ethics, uh, we talk about not disturbing another human being's comfort zone. It is a very difficult topic, we talk about it a lot, but few understand it. I also do not understand it fully, but uh, I will try to share with you what I know about business ethics. <coughs> Some definitions defining morality, ethics and ethical theory. Morality is concerned with the norms, values and beliefs embedded in social processes which define right and wrong for an individual or a community. What does the society consider as right? What does the society consider as wrong? And you will say, I am the society. Yes, you are. We are all contributing to the society and we all attempt to change things that the society considers as right, but we as people feel uncomfortable, we as individuals feel uncomfortable about. Morality is what? a larger chunk of the society feels is right or wrong, appropriate or inappropriate. Ethics is concerned with the study of morality and the application of reason to elucidate specific rules and principles that determine right and wrong for a given situation. So, ethics is an application of morality. Ethics is an attempt to define morality in terms of why something is right or wrong. We, we study why the society, why a large number of people consider something to be as right or wrong and that is called ethics and the reasons then help us take, bridge the gap between morality and the law. The law is very clear cut and ethics serves as a bridge between morality and what, how morality can be implemented. Now, these rules that we elucidate from the, from, from morals are called ethical theories. How do we take a decision as to what is right and what is wrong and, and uh, you know, what are the steps we follow, what is the reasoning we give, 
all of this constitutes ethical theories. We will talk about them in just a few minutes. Relationship between morality, ethics and ethical theory. Morality, ethics rationalizes morality. Ethics helps us understand reasons why something is right or wrong, why the society considers something as right or wrong. So, ethics rationalizes morality to produce ethical theory that can be applied to given situations and that in turn translates into rules and laws and these can generate potential solutions to ethical problems. Okay. Why is business ethics important? Again very general topic, but I think we should talk about it a little bit. Uh, business is exerting a lot of power and control on uh, our daily lives. Uh, people have money, people have power, people have connections. So, you know the, the, uh, uh, the number of people who use your product or service uh, usually or tends to determine, I would say usually, but tends to determine uh, what is considered uh, right and wrong and how it is implemented. Business has the potential to provide a major contribution to our societies in terms of producing the products and services that we want, providing employment, taxes, etc. So, business is important and how the business runs is what we decide, you know, we decide whether the business is running uh, well or not, how many people are getting affected and all that constitutes business ethics. Malpractices in business have the potential to inflict enormous harm on individuals, communities and the environment. You say why am I learning this in a class on human resources? We are learning all these things because as HR managers, as potential HR managers, we need to know, we need to be able to understand how what our company is doing is going to affect the people who are going to be associated with the company as stakeholders. We will talk about the stakeholder theory in the next class, but uh, right now you know we need to know what, how whatever we are doing is going to influence the environment that our organization functions in. When people do not follow the law, when people are not ethical, when they are doing things that the society that hurt the society, then a lot of people you know that they can, they can inflict a lot of damage on the environment they are a part of. and that can be detrimental to humanity at large sometimes. Uh, the demands being placed on business to be ethical by its various stakeholders are constantly becoming more complex and challenging. We are more aware of what is right, what is wrong, what can and cannot be done, what should and should not be done. So, as human resources managers, it is very important for us to know what the society expects from our organization people are more aware, they know what organizations can and cannot do, should and should not do. We as HR managers need to bridge the gap between the environment and the decision makers in our organization and let them know that if we want to survive in the society in this environment, we need to take care of certain things. We need to ensure that we do not hurt the comfort zones of the very people we are here for. Few business people have received formal business ethics or training, so it is very important that we study ethics here in this class. And ethical violations continue to occur in businesses, sometimes voluntarily, intentionally, sometimes unintentionally. So it is very, very important. Various ways in which different uh, sized companies view business ethics, this table is very interesting. So I thought I would share it with you. Uh, please pause your screens for a minute and see what is there in this table. Uh, we have divided the organizations based on their size and or Crane and Matten, the authors have divided the organizations based on their size and what they do. So, large corporations, small businesses, civil society organizations and public sector organizations. The main priorities of large corporations in dealing with business ethics are financial integrity money matters, very, very important employee and customer issues. So, they are looking at these things. Uh, on the other hand, small businesses are only concerned with employee issues because in order to stabilize, they do not have too many complications with their financial matters. At the same time, civil society organizations have a responsibility, have are accountable to their clients to deliver the mission that they exist for. So, they are looking into that also, that is a big ethical issue that they face. 
uh, integrity of tactics. They are they exist for the community, so they need to do things right, and they are accountable. They need to be legitimate. Why? Because a lot of people are counting on them to do what they are there for. And public sector organizations have to follow the law. Uh, they need to take care of corruption, there could be conflicts of interest, procedural issues and they also have to be accountable to the community they function in and to their clients and other stakeholders much more than other organizations. Now approach to managing ethics in large corporations, uh, uh, they have formal public relations or they have a systems based procedure for dealing with managing uh, ethics or dealing with ethics. And in small businesses, it's trust based. You call somebody and tell them, please don't do this. Make sure you do the right thing. So it's more of informal one on one kind of uh, procedure of managing ethics. Uh, civil society uh, organizations, again, uh, we, we appeal to the, uh, uh, to the emotions, to, uh, um, uh, to the values value systems of the people involved in the organizations and in public sector organizations the procedure is very formal and bureaucratic. Then in large organizations uh, the people who are responsible uh, for maintaining ethical standards and uh, uh, or the people who we are accountable to are uh, the shareholders and other stakeholders sorry the people who we are accountable to are stakeholders. In small businesses, the owners are responsible for and, you know, uh, accountable for uh, 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 maintaining ethical standards. In civil society organizations, it's donors and clients. And in public sector organizations, the accountability is to the general public and higher level government organizations are responsible for maintaining the ethics. Main constraints that large organizations face or large corporations face are first is shareholder orientation. What do shareholders want? Do they want money? Do they want the end product to be to be uh, big or do they want everything to be done right? And we will come to this how or what business later. And because of their sheer size, the complexity of managing ethical standards becomes very high. Small businesses, they may have the lack of uh, resources and they may not be able to focus so much attention on business ethics because of the uh, lack of resources, because they are so busy stabilizing, they may not know a lot of things. Civil society organizations, again training is a big issue and in public sector organizations, we get so complacent, I should not say we, I mean a lot of, uh, uh, you know, when I say we, I mean everybody, uh, there may be a lack of transparency in order to maintain confidentiality. So, uh, you know, it's, it's a very dicey game, it's very challenging and uh, as hard as one may try, uh, sometimes mistakes are made inadvertently, but we need to be as careful as possible. Okay, ethical impacts of globalization on different stakeholder groups, as far as ethics are concerned, uh, various stakeholders are shareholders, so they become very aware and they may be liable to risks. Employees again, you know what kind of jobs are given to them, how they manage those jobs, etc. Consumers, uh, uh, the goods that they consume that can, uh, you know, and how they consume their goods, where are these goods made, um, etc. So, uh, I mean we do not care, we just want to have something. I will give you the example of a very uh, well known case of IKEA carpets. IKEA is a Swedish um, organization and they have businesses all over the world and at one point of time they were accused of uh, sourcing carpets from places where uh, or sourcing carpets from um, uh, workshops where children were put to make those carpets. So, they were, they were accused of encouraging child labor by buying carpets from these people. Now, IKEA is such a huge organization and they were flabbergasted. They did not want to do anything unethical. So, they went and they investigated and they eventually came up with a system called rug mark. And uh, rug mark is uh, assurance of, of no child labor and you can read up on this rug mark R U G M A R K 
and rug mark is if and if you see a rug mark uh, a stamp on any carpet you can be assured that this carpet was made in a workshop where no children were employed in making this carpet so but then it's such a large organization people want these beautiful carpets they don't know where it is coming from somebody sitting somewhere sources it to somebody who wants to get the job done for various reasons and many times we don't even know who you know where what is happening at the back end and that's exactly what happened with ikea and of course as soon as they were alerted to it they took steps to prevent this from happening but anyway so this is one example of globalization and how consumer products can affect what uh, you know can can uh, 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 make us vulnerable to uh, to unethical practices okay suppliers and competitors uh, suppliers in developing countries face regulation from mncs through supply chain management again you know we we are competing with various people so there's always competition and that puts a lot of pressure on us to perform and that can open a lot of doors to 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 unethical practices civil society again uh, ngos etc people's awareness is rising there are people there are groups out there that are ensuring that these people are doing what is right and that puts a pr lot of pressure on us to do things the way they need to be done government and regulation laws are being amended every day and we are trying to make sure we stay within the confines of the law and still make a pro profit so this is what globalization is doing to different groups of uh, stakeholders corporations and business ethics again Uh, corporations are regarded as artificial persons by the law so anything that the corporation does is liable to legal uh, uh, questioning and uh, uh, we if if as a corporation we are doing something we need to be aware of how our actions are impacting others around us and that is why it's very important to study business ethics and to be to to be alert to be aware of our environment and how you know we can end up hurting our environment okay um various things that i want to bring to your notice here again you know i'll just i'll just make you aware of these small concepts this is not a class on business ethics this is a class on human resources but i think these terms will help you understand ethical issues when we address them in the next lecture ethical absolutism deals with universal principles some of us are very rigid on what we think is right or wrong so you know some of us are absolutists now being an absolutist which means we we uh, 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 we have very strict notions of what is right what is wrong what should be done what should not be done and and such people are excellent enforcers of rules and laws any high uh, risk activity can be entrusted to people who are ethical absolutists because these people will not let even one thing go astray so these people are make very good uh, auditors for example you know you you are you are uh, very sure of of uh, uh, of what should be considered as right or wrong um, ethical relativism on the other hand is a little more open little more flexible and according to to the ethical relativistic thinking relativistic thinking in uh, uh, we feel that uh, things are right and morality is context dependent and subjective and everybody does things right from their own perspective so if you look at it things from somebody else's perspective you may agree to what they are saying so you know one shouldn't judge everything based on a single set of standards and uh, that is what relative uh, relativism is all about you know you you look at things contextually and look for a rationale for the decisions that people make and pluralism is we all coexist so live and let live and uh, pluralism is okay i mean you are right where you are i am right where i am i don't have to agree to you you don't have to agree to me we are all coexisting i don't need to know the reason for you to uh, uh uh to be making your decisions i don't need to know why you've made a particular decision i uh, may or may not agree with it but but we coexist and you let me be and i will let you be so that is pluralism some theories in business ethics 
we have egoism, we have utilitarianism and we have rights and justice. Now three theories or three of the theories that can determine how business decisions are made are egoism where a person puts his or her individual desires and interests before everyone else's. The benefit coming to me is more important than the benefit going to anyone else. If I get what I need from this situation, it is okay. If I do not get it, then it is wrong. Okay, And we try and maximize desires or self-interest. That is egoism. Uh, <coughs> and it is a consequentialist ethic. The end result is more important for me. What I get in the end is much more important for me than how I get it. If I get what I want, all is okay, all is well that ends well. And that is a con consequentialist ethic, it is a plus minus game. So, if the profit is more than the loss, whatever I have done is, is all right. Utilitarianism is again a consequentialist um, ethic or consequentialist way of making decisions where we say if in the end whatever has come has given us better things or the utility of whatever we have done is higher for a larger number of people then it is okay. So, collective welfare takes precedence over individual welfare and over the duty or the process or how things were done. If collectively things are being uh, are, are uh, being considered okay, if they are benefiting a larger number of people, then it is okay. So, that is what utilitarianism says, you know, uh, and that is a consequentialist ethic. Again, towards the end, everything should be okay for most people. Rights and justice are more about not crossing your line, not infringing upon another person's zone. Uh, it deals with respect for human beings uh, and it is a non-consequentialist ethic. It does not matter whether whatever you are doing benefits uh, you know several people, if it inconveniences people, if how you do it has inconvenienced some people then it is not right. Everybody has a right to their own space, to their own uh, way of doing things, to their own thinking and if we infringe upon that then even if the end result ends up benefiting them it is not right. So, uh, this is, these are some of the ways in which we make decisions. Okay. Example of a utilitarian analysis in the case of child labor. Hmm. Uh, I will just show you how people make decisions. Action 1 is doing the deed. Right. So, uh, uh, say you you have uh, a case of child labor where uh, a person has to decide between making a deal with a dealer who sources carpets from a workshop where children are employed to make carpets. Now let us see there are two options here either you do the deal you get those carpets from that dealer or you do not get the carpets from that dealer. Okay. So, this is doing the deal or not doing the deal, making the deal or not doing the deal. Pleasure, we are, we are dealing with utilitarian analysis, how do we assess things? This is a nice dilemma that is presented here in the book. The pleasure that comes to the product and the, the stakeholders here are the product manager. Say let us, let us, uh, I am sorry, I will remove the word thigh here from here. I will remove this word from here, it should be just dealer. So, any dealer could be a Thai dealer, could be an Indian dealer, it does not matter. What is important here is what is being dealt with here. Hmm. We could have the product manager who has to buy a certain number of carpets and uh, please focus on the slide now. So, and we have the dealer who thinks, uh, uh, who needs to get the deal the parents or who is the direct contact or who is the, the go between um, uh, the, the liaison between the product manager and the family of the or the uh, uh, source of these carpets. And uh, we have the parents of the children, we have children themselves and maybe a grandmother at home. So, let us <coughs> consider this situation. Now, the product manager says that if I do the deal, if I make the deal, if I buy these carpets, I will get a good deal for the business. Hmm. And if I get a good deal for the business, I could get a personal bonus. 
the pain I will face is bad conscience. My God, they employ small children. Um, I will feel uncomfortable. You know, there could be a possible risk for company reputation if the company is sued for child labor by, by human rights uh, organizations. So that could be detrimental. Hmm. Uh, the dealer says, okay, I am getting the money, so it is a good deal. So it is all pleasure. There is no pain involved. The parents say that it is necessary to do the deal to secure the family's income. Again, they also feel bad about having their children work because the prospects for children are limited. The children feel good about being needed, being grown up, they get the approval of the parents, people say, oh, you are doing a fantastic job, you are doing such good work. So, they feel great, but it is physical hard labor and they have no chance of school education and they realize it later when they grow up. Grandmother is very happy, if the deal is done, the family is able to look after her needs. So, everybody is okay and let us hope this is a nice grandmother. So, she will feel bad about the children not doing the, I mean children not getting the education. Now, if the deal is not done, if the dealer, if the product manager decides not to source carpets from this factory, the pleasure is that there is less legal risk, there is good conscience, but on the other hand, the pain will be loss of a good deal. He may lose out on his bonuses. He may need to find another place. Not doing the deal for the dealer will be loss of good deal. He will have to search for a new customer. He may or may not find somebody. His children may go hungry at the end of the day. Parents will have to search for other sources of income. Their children know how to make carpets, but they are not able to sell the carpets because they cannot make the carpets without the help of these children. And uh, for whatever reason, if the carpet is not sold, they will have to wait to eat. Children not doing the deal, pleasure is no hard work. <clears throat> they have time to play and go to school and grow up beautifully. But the pain is they are, they may be potentially forced to do other more painful work that may not be as productive. And for the grandmother, there could be loss of economic support. So, when we look at this chart as uncomfortable as it sounds, uh, it is a, uh, when you look at the way this has been analyzed, you will see that it is important for this family to go ahead and do the deal. Based on this plus minus cost benefit analysis, the, the uh, deal will be done. So, it's, it's uh, you know, you just, just look at this, just compare these things, it is such a tight situation. This is the situation that ethics put us in, you know, our standards, our willingness to look after the interests of the, uh, or our keenness to, to uh, take the interests of uh, people around us into account puts us in this kind, kind of a tight bind, where we have to decide what is good and what is bad. When you look at this, you say, my God, I have been thinking about child labor and this and that, but then I do not know maybe from the perspective of the family, uh, this is good. Maybe from the perspective of the, of the family involved, there is a choice between the devil and the deep sea. Let us say the dealer have find something else, but this family may end up suffering a lot more by not letting their children work. So, what do we do? How do we decide? Are we in a position to give them alternative uh, sources of employment or income? If we are, then we go ahead and forget about the deal. But if we are not able to do that, then what do we do? So, we feel uncomfortable both ways. And this is one way in which we do a cost benefit analysis as employees, as human beings, as people, as corporations, and then decide what we want to do and what we do not want to do. Now, I wanted to share this dilemma with you so it would get you thinking about how this whole uh, sticky concept of business ethics work, works. In the next lecture, we will deal with the application of whatever we have studied in this lecture in human resources management, specifically in the context of, you, of, of us being managers in the human resources department. So, thank you for listening.